Welcome to Watching Silent Films. This is Yifang, and with me are my co-hosts, uh, Lily and Adam. Hello there. Hello. Greetings. Greetings, greetings. This is the penultimate episode, and if you don't know what that word means, it means the, the one next to the last. Um, I made that announcement last episode, but uh, we'll get into that more in the final episode. Um, but for now, this will be the final episode from Adam. Thank you very much. He is a longtime listener. And uh, we exchanged emails one day, and now he's a co-host. So, because it's very everybody can come and be a co-host. So, <laughs> thank you very much, Adam, for uh, taking the time out of your busy schedule. My pleasure. Very much appreciate it. So now you're on both sides. So you're both the the, the fan, but also creating the the content they're going to listen to. I don't think Sounds your episodes great. are out actually at the time of this no, recording, it but it will be in the you know, whenever Ellie posts this stuff up, so. Soon. <laughs> oh, so, that's all right. So, all right, so today we're going to talk about Harold Lloyd's 1923 Safety Last, which is one of the best movies really ever made. Uh, before I get there, just a little bit of what we've been watching. Um, have you guys had a chance to watch anything in the classic realm? Lily nice. or... Yeah, I'm still making my way through Gentlemen Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> uh, I still okay. have not finished it yet, but I'm working through it. <laughs> it does not help <laughs> when, well, you know, you, you, because we have our podcast, you know, I have to watch this. I have to watch our silent film, and that's completely fine. But any other film, I'm like, oh, you know, whatever. Um, I did watch a film last week called Greta that was on... Amazon Prime because I have it for a month so it was very it was interesting it was it's not it's more modern it came out last year but it's uh it was written and directed and starred this one girl who lives in New York City it's kind of about depression but it's also not and also finding your happiness in life um I believe the film's under 20 minutes long so it's not the it's not the Greta film with Chloe Grace Moretz. It's um more of an indie feature. So if you want to see something different, I'd I'd watch it again and take a look. Amazon Prime. Boom. <laughs> sounds interesting. Is it over to me? Yep. Over to you, Adam. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh last week uh you mentioned greed. Uh so I just had the urge to watch it. I did find a, the four-hour uh, version of it on Nice. Vimeo. Yeah. Um, I read the background a little bit about how they colored everything in that gold, and that, that must have been just so uh, painstaking to do that. Um, it was synced to the music of Johnny Greenwood, which I'm not familiar with, and but it was after listening to it for so long, I had to switch it to Pandora just to just to come out of the depression it was putting me in. Um, hmm. the description of the story is John Mateague. It's, it's taken from a book called Mateague. He's a miner working in California. A traveling dentist called himself Dr. Painless Potter visits the town, and Mateague's mother begs Potter to take her son as an apprentice. Potter agrees. Mateague, ev uh, yeah, Mateague eventually becomes a dentist practicing on Folk, Folk Street in San Francisco. Uh, if I read it right, this might have been one of the first ones to shoot on location for the whole thing. Um, I didn't realize that was the case because I thought I've seen other films before that shooting on location, but um, uh, I'm not really sure how they categorize things. Uh, basically, the drama starts when his best friend, uh, Marcus, brings in his uh, cousin, Trina, to have her teeth worked on, and Mateek fell in love with her as he was examining her, and it was getting to the point where, as she was under with the ether, he was uh, basically inhaling her hair. Uh, and it was just, you know, it was a little bizarre for that alone. And uh, Trina, uh, after she came to, there's this woman that would come through the offices or the boarding house. I think he might have worked out of his boarding house um, selling lottery tickets. She buys one, uh, I think, I'm not sure if it was for a dollar or not, but anyway, she wins five thousand dollars. And uh, before this even happened, uh, Mateague and uh, Marcus agreed 
that Trina could be uh, Teague's. Uh, Marcus actually wanted to marry her too, which I don't know how that works with first cousins, but apparently that seemed to be something that was in the works. Uh, but they were such a good friend, and he saw how uh, much Matigue was in love with her that um, he says, "Okay, that's fine." But when she won the five thousand dollars, he, you know, he took an about face mentally, and uh, just things. Just uh, there was a rift that uh, happened, uh, basically all over money. I mean, the title "Greed" played such a big part of, of basically the whole movie. Uh, after they got married, uh, Trina refused to spend any of her $5,000, and she would earn money on the side, and she was completely obsessed with that $5,000. I think the only thing she might have used some of it for was uh, her uncle's business, uh, and he would have to pay interest back. Uh, the novel was written in 1899, uh, and it was based on a real crime in 1850. could have been the same spot. I'm not sure on that location. It was Eric von Strom, uh, Eric Stronheim. Uh, there was 85 hours of footage before editing. It was supposed to go for about nine hours, and the studio made him cut it down. But uh, there's been writings that um, nine hours was mostly, you know, unrefined. So I don't know if that would have been the true length of the film that Stronheim wanted. Uh, but it, he got it down to four, and then they got it down from that to, I think, maybe two hours. I'm not sure what. And they basically cut the two of the subplots. Um, he did a lot uh, – Stronheim did a lot with um, uh, using metaphors like a cat was used as a stand-in for Marcus and the lovebirds in the cage that uh, Matig was really into would stand for the couple. And, and so the cat was eyeing the, uh, the cage all the time trying to devour the birds, and Marcus was basically wanting uh, in on that money. Uh, the uh, film was hand-tinted in gold in many spots, the coins, the candle flames, the canary, done by a process called hand Uh I really didn't understand how that works out, but there was a name to it. Um, oh, the um, wedding scene when they got married, Stronheim uh, just showed more metaphors of the lower class. They weren't on par with the – the quote-unquote higher class, and they would show a couple of the people feeding off the skulls of some animal. Uh, I've never seen like that ever before. You know, it was just – it was. I don't even know what the animal was, but there was two of them just gnawing away, and the meat was already gone off the, the skull, so you were looking at the skull. Um, normally in films, meals would be shown with dignity and a sense of community, but images of small, a small person, a hunchback, a woman with buck teeth – the boy on crutches, uh, with other guests crudely devouring their males like animals. He would show their lower class environment as like uh, when they were courting each other. They would sit on a sewer and there'd be a dead rat right next by. And when they were uh, kissing, a garbage truck would uh, drive by. So there was, these are all images that he was playing with and getting you into the story itself. Uh, the junk man, which was one of the subplots that were put in, what, what happened was um, the film was gone, but they found – a lot of um, photographs uh, was basically scene by scene by scene, so they just filled it in and told you what the story would have been. And uh, the junk man was played by Cesar Gravina, and he was in The Man Who Laughs, which is one of the movies I really liked. Um, he was the one taking care of Gwen Plan and Dia. Um, and that's a bit about that. It was, um, you know, it was a long viewing, and like I said, the music kind of depressed me, but. Um, it was definitely, you know, something to see. And the last scene in the desert was uh, – the story behind it I think might have been more interesting than the actual watching it because uh, they were truly in 120-degree heat, and the camera itself had to be wrapped in uh, ice cubes and towels uh, just not to uh, melt. Um, and that's it. Wow. <laughs> what a story. So, uh, you know, uh, hopefully – you know, in time, you might find a, a better music accompaniment because, you know, music yeah. makes these movies. But um, yeah. having said all of that, the uh, – what do you want to call it? The, uh, did you think it it was worthy of all those praises last night? As you know, it's um, – Definitely. Well, the more I read into it, yeah. and then it's something – it's one of those things that you might not realize what you're looking at until you read what other people had to say about it. Like he, because the Turner Classic has a, a uh, by the way, musical score. Oh, 
uh, composed by because the version that you saw, right, that the four hour version has the Robert Israel score. It just uh, the reason why you didn't find it there is because that's copyright and therefore they can't right. post on Vimeo. That's why. Yeah, he threw his own, and he said yeah. that in his notes. Right. Uh, but it was depressing. <laughs> it was really depressing. And four hours of is, that. So is it worthy of that? The uh, all these praises that you think that people have lavished upon it over the well, years. Well, putting it in the context of the time, uh, definitely. Uh, he they said something about him using long focus, which um, you know I don't think I noticed at the time, but I can see it uh, how it was played. Uh, the four hour version gave it room to breathe, and they you saw the story because before I saw I think the two hour version and the subtitles were in Italian, so I had to translate it myself. It was on DVD, so I couldn't even. Uh, switch anything. Um, so this time I actually saw the story. Uh, yeah, uh, it was definitely interesting. It was a lot to it. Yeah. Yeah, there are uh, over over time all the greats, as it were, meaning like even contemporaries of um, of silent film uh, makers, they would lavish praises upon it. The ones that yeah. have they have seen like uh, Sergei, Sergei Eisenstein, the Russian director, really liked it. Uh, Ernst Lubitsch, as we know, loved it. Uh, Jean Renoir, son of that painter, loved right. it. Even uh, Guillermo del Toro says he's called it, um, quote, a perfect reflection of the anxiety permeating the passage into the 20th century and absolute dehumanization that was to come. Mm. And on and on. I mean, it's just... You know, the anywhere from the Hitchcocks to, uh, you know, the who's who's, you know, they all just have high praises on it. I've only, I, I can't remember because there was, there has never been really a good home video copy of it. Mm-hmm. So if I, if I ever watch it, I must have seen the uh, two hour. I haven't had a chance to watch the four hour one yet. Well, that was just um, filled in with photographs, and then the yeah, yeah, I know that's the, the reconstruction. Yeah, yeah right, but that's right. you know sometimes that that helps you understand the story better. You oh, know yeah. what I mean? And so, it included the two subplots. The only people to really have a happy existence in that film was the elderly couple in um right. in the boarding house. But you know, like the even the four hour is still not the six five or six or something ridiculous right. like that cut. <laughs> so, and I think well, uh. Von Strong, I don't know how much you researched into him. It was very much um, full of himself. I think just oh, in course. time, he. I, I think that's part of his. Well, at least that's what historians say is that it is is the uh, failure is that because he was so abrasive that people just often yeah got rid of his movies. Um, well, when he was in the desert, he wanted the two to look like they really hated each other. He says, I want you two to hate each other like you hate me. Right. Uh, so that says something. <laughs> Plus, I read uh, that book that you recommended a while ago. Yeah. And he was mentioned in there. And I, that always stuck in my head because it was the 60s by then. Yeah. And he recreated what they, you know, what he did for um, exactly. Greg Garbo. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there's a, I don't know if it's still relevant today, but. In uh, a lot of like uh, filmmaking history, there's a stereotype of what a director looks like with the monocle oh, yeah. Yeah. and the cigar. Well, it all came from this guy. He's kind yeah. of the – Eric Van Stroheim was the pro- predecessor or prototypical sort of uh, European director who was the know-it-all and came in in very much dictator-like fashion. <laughs> but he's he the I mean, Sunset Boulevard? Was that him? How's that? Was he the one in Sunset Boulevard? Uh, I don't know if he was in it, but I, I can't remember. But he was definitely, uh, you know, he would have been. Uh, yeah, that, butler, that was him. That's right. The butler was a, a famous yeah, director. Yeah, that was him. Yeah, that was. Yeah, that's what I thought. So it was director right. of Billy Wilder, who obviously yeah. was, you know, doing a take on right the transitioning of the, the, the film histories and that. But he appeared in it. Yeah. That was a fun movie. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Highly recommend it. This cut or? 
yeah, uh, just with different music. But otherwise, yeah, um, I got everything I wanted out of it, and I was satisfied. Yeah, I've been wanting to watch it for a long time because it was in that book I mentioned, One Thousand and One movies you must see before you die and so i right. it was just like it was always in well, my you head saw the two hour cut right uh with italian subtitles so that uh, that uh, it was just horrible um so you, you were counting that right that uh viewing no i really am not uh this one as far as i'm concerned was seeing it for the first time got it got it yeah cool anything else well i did watch a german one uh i've become a fritz lang fan big time uh this yep. is 1924 the Nibelungen. Oh yeah, heard of that? Yeah, fantasy. Um, yeah, that's on canopy. But there's two um, two parts to it. The first one was the one yeah. we're watching. The second one, one, part two, took forever. Yeah. Um, it was just really drawn out. But the first one was really good. It was basically yeah. the Lord of the Rings of the day. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it's it, obviously it based everything. on it's based on his uh, the Germanic uh, mythologies, yeah. right? So from 1200, yeah, it was. Um, right. Which is where, you know, of course, Lord of the Rings got yep. a lot of their stuff from. from, from I think the George R.R. R. Martin might have watched this too. I'm not sure if I read that right. And so if he did, I would think Game of Thrones had something to owe toward it. Um, right. But there was just more – it was more visual than I thought it would be. Yeah. I mean it starts off I, – I don't know what those – people were that was around him teaching him how to be a blacksmith but uh they look like maybe trolls or something right uh the the uh dragon that he had to uh kill um that was amazing that was uh that was a huge prop that many people had to get in there to to work around um yeah the whole thing was great the sets it was just really good uh yeah, that's those are the two things. Yeah, if you keep going, uh, I really loved his. Oh, all of his songs are great, obviously, including you know the Metropolises. Oh yeah. Um yeah. and Destroy, and that one that you just mentioned. I mean, mo- and uh, you know any and all of his works is great, especially this Destiny. one. Destiny. But... Destiny. Yeah, I yeah, any of those. And once ago, it, yeah. once he transitions into talkies, really he brought he really is the connection piece. In my opinion, and he's one of many, mm-hmm. but I feel like if you had to peg, if you had to encapsulate this movement uh, and trace how noir, film noir that we know yeah. later on, the, in terms of like the uh, bo- bogey film noir, yeah, uh, and um, what's McCagney and any of those, uh, you can actually trace it through this guy, uh, Fritz Lang, that he would take sort of a lot of the German expressionism concepts and ideas. And through just immigrating and, 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 uh, taking that idea from Europe and directly dumping it into, uh, Hollywood. And yeah. by the time he made talkies, it, uh, he, I mean, you know, when you get there, I don't know if you're going to continue, but if you do. Oh, I, I've already watched a couple from the forties. Uh, oh ago. man. Like, uh, uh John Gardenia, Bennett. I think Clash it's the Scarlet, of, the Scarlet yeah, Street. Scarlet Street, uh, Blue Gardenia, uh, uh, Clash that might of have the, been the other one. Yeah, yeah classic. Well, John Bennett was in both of them, whatever the second one was. Uh, you only live once. Any of those. Yeah. All um, of those are just incredible movies. Well, yeah. yeah, technically, but the story is just so like it's really rich, and it's just full of like you know like noir. It it is kind of, has got everything right. The femme fatale. Well, suit. And, suit. <laughs> yeah, everything. Everything you can think ben of that. Dre or something. He was. Yeah, he everything was you can the pimp, think of but... that is like the stereotype of what film noir yeah. is yeah. there are elements that came from like you know all of his films so yeah i think you know he's either the godfather or the grandfather of 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 noir that we know of today and he you can trace the direct path from the expressionism the dark well, scarlet expressionism. street was uh done as a french film like 10 to 14 years earlier i think right. it, that one might have been called the bitch if translated into Eng- english right. right um but yeah uh, of course, you know M. You've seen M, right? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing, especially that last um, the I speech. Don't know what to call that speech? Okay, yeah. Uh, Everybody wants to stop a speech. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can hear a pin drop when he's just screaming, and it's like you've never. I don't think I've heard anything on film in that area before or after. You know, before 1950, anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so the point is, uh, you know, he he ultimately. 
uh, brought so much, I think, uh, from, 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 from the oldest to the newest, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. I yeah. Think his, I'm on Team Lang. Yeah. His final efforts were, there's a movie that took place in India. I can't remember whether it was the tiger or something and the Indian tomb. And then the final one, final, final ones, the thousand eyes of Dr. Mabusi, which is the final wrap up. Yeah. I haven't seen that yet. Of the, uh, it's kind of like the Fritz Lang universe where yeah. this recurring character, Dr. Mabusi, in his direct, his, uh, detective, what's his name? There's a detective character in here. Yeah, I, I, I'm not good with names. Uh, Inspector Loman, that's what it is. So Inspector um, Loman actually appears in other movies, such as M. So somehow this, yeah, he, I think we he talked seeds... about one last week. Yeah, he seeds uh, the Inspector Loman across other movies too. The so Indian quite was the one before. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So he's a he's a definitely one of the greats of film Absolutely. history. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Anything else? No, I think I've talked enough. <laughs> oh no, we uh, want to hear everything you have to say. Yeah, I know. Uh, I just get self conscious after a while of talking too long. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> am I boring everyone? What's going well, on? What would you What would you recommend, Nilly, to start off with? Uh, as far as Lang or anything in Lang, general? Lang, yeah, first Lang, yeah, first Lang. Uh, the first, yeah, one. Um, yeah, well, I'm in love with the first one I just saw, uh, the Nibelungen. I think that means the tribe of people or something, because I tried to look mm-hmm. up to see what that meant, and um, I think it's just the name of their group of people. Uh, but, well, I don't know. Lily's taste, but um, it just you know if you like Lord of the Rings, that's kind of it for 1924. Mm. Uh, it's kind of I mean it's like watching Irwin Allen a little bit. <laughs> well, is it on the level of le- like I like fantasy stories and I do like Lord of the Rings. Um, okay, I'm not I'm not a gigantic fan of it, but I you know I respect what they did because it's such the trilogy is incredible. Yeah. Between, you know, what they did in the early 2000s. But is it on the it's level on of, like... Oh, that's good. Do, would uh, you say it's, it's like, So Haxon? just to let you know which one to... um, I think it's more interesting than Hexen, to tell you the truth. Um, that's good. <laughs> uh, the Nibelungen, uh, just to give you... Uh, there's two of them. Go for the one that says Siegfried. Basically, mm-hmm. the second one, uh, I don't think it's spoiling anything to say that he gets killed at the end of it. And his second movie was just the wife, uh, you know... A, just doing anything she can to get the guy who killed him killed and it took all of the movie to do it uh, and it just wasn't worth it uh so just the first one you can stop hmm. interesting okay sounds yeah, good yeah the whole thing was just very very i mean it was visual it was so visual it was it, it didn't let you stop and you had so much to look at and uh, obviously it's 1924 so don't be too critical <laughs> the, the dragon doesn't look that real <laughs> but you know we we're a uh, silent film podcast we we've been there we well, you know what it is, is I've been reading this book on Nosferatu, and that's what's been pointing me toward uh, the student in Prague, this one. Uh, as I go along, it's just like uh, The Parade Gone By. It's, uh, it keeps recommending films, only right. it's all German. Um, right. So, yeah, I've been having a great time with that book. Yeah. Well, that well, that the whole thing was based on the uh, ring cycle, right? That, that whole day, uh, Nibelung uh, mythology. It's actually... So that the films somehow or I think uh initially got inspired by Richard Wagner, the yes. uh, music composer. Uh there's a Germanic language uh epic. It's it's called the Ring and it's like a four part cycle. That I didn't know. Uh, yeah. loosely based on characters in the Norse saga, which is why it's got a familiar ring to Lord of the Rings, which is where you know, right. it heavily inspired a lot of the things that uh, Lord of the Rings is about because they're very much, you know, J.R. Tolkien was a big student of old heroic mythic legends of the. Uh, the yeah, there's uh, this, there's a movie on him on probably HBO about a year or two ago, uh, so I got a piece of that. He had to have seen this film. Uh, he's never into movies. I don't know about that, uh, but I know that he he's really into the primary sources. So yeah. he's not just about the movies. He's really he would have probably read the original Germanic or Nordic language works, right? Or maybe perhaps probably. even the opera. But he probably was never really into the movies. 
Maybe. Oh. So, uh, anyway, well, I think it was fun, and it's free. It's canopy. Right. So the 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 sort of the rough story or plot of the ring cycle is about a magic ring <laughs> that grants the power to rule the world. Yeah, that's not, by Nibelung well, dwarves. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not in the story at all. Uh, all right, but the point is that's, that's a backdrop, movie. Yeah. right? Yeah. So you know, and, and and there's a lot of gods and goddesses, and you yeah. know, all sorts of. Well, it was mostly about much... him being in love with uh, some king's sister and what he had to do uh, to basically win her over, and then that king wanted someone else, so he had something that made him invisible to help that king win that person over, and then it right. just all hell broke loose. But anyways, yeah. um, that you know, all of these elements, uh, you know, they all kind of take from one another. You know, the the the, the Germanic root ones takes from the Nordic, and I'm sure Nordic probably stole some stuff from the uh, yeah. mm -hmm. their brothers from the south, and on and on it goes. You know, they're they're very much influenced by one another. You know, over the years, so. Yeah, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, and it was very well restored. It was good. Um, okay, so there you go. Well, if you ever <laughs> get into that. Uh, there was like 11 or 12 sources that they got the film from, too. Yeah. Well, they had to have some of these older ones. Yeah, I just think filter. that's amazing where they get a piece here, a piece there, all around the world, and finally it comes together. Right. Mm-hmm. The Murnau Foundation is part of the people who put it together, so that was interesting just in itself. Yeah, I mean that's their that's their job is to yeah. reconstitute some of these things that have over the years been lost. So, mm -hmm. all right, let's move on into uh, a look at a take on Safety Last, a 1923 American silent film comedy starring Harold Lloyd and. Uh, some background about this this uh very much successful in its time as contemporary it really cemented harold lloyd's status as a major figure um you know you, you often do hear the name uh, uh chaplin keaton but probably nowadays you'll probably hear more about uh chaplin keaton and lloyd but probably in the 80s and 90s that was less so and i think part of the reason is because um What's great about uh, Harold Lloyd, the man himself, is that he actually had the rights to his own movies. Yeah. So um, I would say Chaplin might be the closest uh, to to Lloyd in the sense that, uh, you know, Chaplin also owns rights to his own stuff, but uh, the difference between Lloyd and Chaplin is that Chaplin would uh, uh, sort of bring his work out over and over again through revivals and stuff like that. And, of course, he was incredibly popular and everybody wanted to watch his works over and over and over again. And he was very much uh, agreeable to all of that, right? And so that, I think, lends itself to uh, Chaplin's staying power. Um, in terms of popularity, definitely in terms of popularity, probably greater for sure, just the, both in that time as well as that time since, you know, the silent era. Now, Buster Keaton, of course, doesn't own the rights to his films, sadly, because he's, he, after his, uh, he probably used to own the rights to his shorts and also, uh, up to when he started working for MGM. Mm -hmm. But all of his output after that, uh, he became a, a hired hand, basically. So he didn't have rights to stuff like the cameraman afterwards. But uh, but I don't know what he, he did. I, I never l looked it up. But, uh, you know, for whatever reason, uh, his work was still in demand and very popular in revivals, just like Chaplin. And that's why it leads to why both of those names very much are out there, um, along with many other silent film greats. But I think part of the problem is this... Um, after sort of owning the rights to his films, he really wanted to show these films the way uh, that he means it to be, right? Because he's the original filmmaker. And so he's like, you know, it, 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 people were interested, I think, uh, in trying to get his movies re-released in the movie theaters. But most theaters at that time, because now they're talkies, 
they they don't accommodate uh, uh, piano pianos or organs or anything mm. like that. And so, like, you know, he 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 basically he basically has a mandate saying it's got to be organs or like orchestra or something better, but actually not pianos. He says, and I quote, I just don't like pictures played with pianos. We never intended to, uh, to be played with pianos. Oh, and so wow. from there on, uh, if you don't have an organ, which is expensive, right? They, they probably uh, took a lot of them out uh, after the topics yeah. came out. Yeah. And uh, anyway, long story short, I, I think it's because of his creative control and how he wants his films to be uh, re-released that it never got popular. Um, also, when TV television came around, his prices were also really high. Uh, he wanted uh, 300k per picture for showings, and at that point, I don't know what it was, but it's it's you know he he, he wants it to be done the way he wanted it to be done, you know, and that's why I think his reputation suffered over the years, you know, from the 40s, 50s, and beyond. And um, but you know, after his death. Uh, you know, another corporation, Time Life, uh, you know, started to release that with stuff that he doesn't like, you know, with different frame rates, weird music on it. They don't care. They're, they're in it all to make money. So uh, the, the quality of presentation, the, 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 the thing that he really wanted you know, basically only lasted during his lifetime. Afterwards, when he's gone, I, I don't think his kids, uh, were given the, like to carry on the legacy, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, anyways, that's just some background about uh, Harold Lloyd, and really more about the aftermath. Actually, <laughs> I was going to talk yeah. about how it came to be, but right. Anyway, so that's that's him in a nutshell. Um, in terms of how he, that's why he's not as popular. I guess it's more my thought process going around that. Um. Well, it makes sense, too, when you bring up just the, you know, bringing these reels to the theater. I mean, it comes down to money, unfortunately, even back then. It's like, well, are they going to hire an accompanist or are they going to hire someone else to, you know, just keep doing what they're doing? And, you know, as progression keeps happening with the talkies, you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised they didn't just um, copy it with the soundtrack on it. Just like they do now. Uh, I think Lloyd, like many of the uh, silent filmmakers, really uh, wants this to be performed as it was back in the day. Uh, And that's why he had a stringent requirement for that to to be uh, re in revivals and stuff. Because remember, like back in those days prior to talkies and technology there wasn't any speakers or anything you needed somebody to to be there and provide the accompaniment and the accompaniment that's why like that's the big thing about and we keep it's like a being a dead horse but like we we do like the silent films were meant to be enjoyed like a concert like a music concert and when you watch it in the big theater and you have a live music whatever form it takes place in uh-huh. that music washes over you and you really are in there for an experience like you do a music concert, like whatever, whatever your favorite bands are. And if they're great live and you watch their concert, you'll remember that concert for the rest of your life. And that concert will oh. never happen again. Right. Cause it's, it's a unique mm-hmm. experience where you attended the concert and you remember whether it's the people that you went with or just the experiences of that concert with the artists. You have this, this direct connection and I think the silent film era films were like that. Like they, whatever music was played in that specific time that you were watching that showing, that's the feeling I think it, it's trying to invoke is that y- you remember that, you know? Right. And, right. and so like, there aren't a lot of chances of obviously nowadays to do that, but I s- still remember that I watched Metropolis going back to Fritz Lang when they did the, uh, the complete cut, they found the footage in Brazil. And uh-huh. I watched it with uh, the Allo Orchestra, which is local, by the way, and in Coolidge Corner. I remember that because, uh, you know, like it, it's 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 it literally was a concert, right, of the live accompaniment playing 
even though you're watching the film on screen. It, it is like, and the audiences were going along for the ride in all the right places and you get all the right responses. I mean, that's just uh something that you can't remove from especially silent films. That's unique, you know. Uh, you know, it, it, it it's part of like film film enjoyment and um uh, like you know you can you can certainly do some of that and I certainly there are still some of that like especially when Star Wars came out in seventy seven. I'm sure a lot of people remember where they were when they first sat down somewhere or was with friends in the theater and on and on. Mm -hmm. So that still existed even post, you know, the talkies. But I, but I think silent film era or films from silent era is a a lot more unique because you have this music, live music performing element that doesn't exist in the uh, talkies and after, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm. Yeah. Well, now you've mentioned many times uh, the Avengers, uh, the Marvel, and those are event films for the most part. Right. I know that was something, um, you know, my before he, just before he passed, we took my father and the rest of us went out to see it. And he was very happy to see that, um, you know, that was an exciting time for him. So I'm glad I, you know, we did that. Uh, so, you know, uh, they still have m- movies that create those memories. Right. And, you know, a lot of the times, especially it's something like that, what's going on to the theater. Of course, right now it's a pandemic. The theater's not existing anymore. But, like, yeah. when it was available that you could safely go to one, I think part of it is having those memories, right, with fa- friends and family, and you kind of partake. And that's why you'll often hear a lot of the um, artists who, who are creating these movies uh, liken that to religious experiences. Like, um, I was listening to podcasts from the DGA with the Directors Guild America, and there's a, uh, I think it's James Gray or something. He is a director for Ad Estrada with Brad Pitt. And he says, like, he's an atheist, but he believes that the films, film watching, and the whole experience is very much of a religious experience, like, straight up. Right. <laughs> And even though that he doesn't movie like, was rough. <laughs> right, Sorry, the, but ahead. you get my point is that he, you know, really wants to have the ability for people to go to the theater and have this experience with one another as you do almost like going to church, you know. So anyways, that's totally aside, but mm-hmm. kind of related that the silent filmmakers like Harold Lloyd really treasured that. And even though talkies have pre-recorded sound and it's possible he just was unrelenting i think in terms of not wanting people not to experience that and he, i think he right. really wanted people to have that experiences as they're watching the his specific silent films that are made with specific things in mind in his case he wants people to watch it with the organ and or for orchestras you know yeah so well yeah it's his uh yeah he definitely had the uh fan base to uh to support it so Right. He was into anyway, 3D that's... films for a while. Um, he was really into 3D films. I don't know a lot about it, but I've been hearing that over and over whenever I hear interviews with somebody. Like his. Who, uh, Harold, Harold Lloyd? Harold Lloyd, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. if, if you look into it, I think he might have even done it in the 20s, but I don't, I've never seen any of those. I've seen his 50s stuff. Well, I mean, he's always been into experimenting technology, so that's right. not news. And all, I think all of them were. Um, uh huh. The, the, the Chaplins, the Keatons, all of them have had a hand in experimenting with whether it's the 3D or the widescreen format or even color. All of them have had experience, experiments with this because, you know, whether it's the codec, the makers of the film itself, whether it's the, um, the camera makers or manufacturers or the vendors, they're all going to try to sell some of these technologies, right? To right. all these famous filmmakers and, it's the same thing as today, you know, they, they, whatever new technology they have, they want to sell it. And so like, you know, that's why like James Cameron is still making his avatars in 3d because he, he likes the technology. He wants to use it that way for his movies, you know? And so, you know, so same as it was back then and same as it was today, you know? Right. Anyway. So back to this particular film, Safety Last. I think this is now 
Um, if you were to look at his filmography, uh, Harold Lloyd started in the early 19-teens, 1913, and he would make a series of things, you know, and, um, of course, you know, most of the silent films are lost. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. But what's great is that he, uh, he's kept a lot of them, which is great. Um, but unfortunately, uh, his, his the early film shorts that he kept were lost to fire in his own estate. Like, oh, he no. physically kept it and, you know, so he lost a lot of it, um, in 1943. Yeah. So, um, but, uh, he still carefully preserved a lot of them. And, uh, anyway, so that's the, you know, of all the artists out there, he, he's still pretty, uh, he was able to keep as much of it as possible. The ones that were yeah. lost in the fires. But um, anyway, so like like the uh, all the other silent film comedians we talked about, like the Chaplins, like the Keatons, you know, all of them started with the the, the one reelers, two reelers, right? All the shorts and until the the nineteen uh, uh, 1920s, right? In the 1920s is when all of those artists started to make feature films, which is yeah, it's weird but not weird because that's kind of how the industry worked. So at this point, he would have made uh, uh, he would have been about seven. Uh, let me do the math right? Seven four. So probably uh, about yeah, a decade in the industry or so. You know, starting with the silent shorts, and now he's Made probably two or three uh, films. He did um, Sailor Main Man, Grandma's Boy, Doctor Jack, and now he's he's uh, he, he, this Bumping is his on fourth. Broadway. Uh, I have it as the third, uh, but that's what the commentary I listened to said anyway. Yeah, so whether they yeah. were well, it might have to do with just how um, right the order of when it was shot and it was released, and because uh, uh-huh. they made all these in breakneck speed, right? So, uh-huh. anyways, so, um, so anyways, that's, this is the, uh, the, uh, the feature that was made and it's directed by, uh, Hal Roaches is very, very famous, um, not directed, I'm sorry, produced by Hal Roach. Well, Hal Roach is very popular because he, he's a member for stuff like Lauren Hardy franchise and Charlie Chase and our gang, but he also was very much a staple of the silent film era, uh, mm. launching careers of many, many, many actors, actresses, and other people. Um, but, um, anyways, so, and his stars, a lot of his pictures stars, uh, uh, his, I don't, I don't think they were married yet, but it, it, they would have been eventually. Right afterwards. His wife. Yeah. yeah. So, So that's kind of the safety last. I think he's um, – it's it's a little bit like a uh, – at that point, they're turning – they're not quite – or maybe they were. I'm not sure what – how do you draw the lines. But they're kind of like getting into kind of a studio system, uh, at least the very much the early days or versions or iterations of their studio system, which was like a, a dream factory, they call it. You'll pump out film after film after film, right? And this is very much no different that – at this point, they're well, well, well oil, well, well oil machine, and uh, with a lot of experiences, uh, just like all of his contemporaries. You know, you work on this story, and just, uh, anyways, um, what do you guys think overall of this uh, safety last? Well, I watch this on Criterion, like everything else, uh, whenever I can. Uh, let's see, this one had the commentary with Leonard Malton and Harold Lloyd's longtime archivist, archivist. Richard Carell, which I've never heard of the second person. Uh, So I kind of took notes as they were rattling off. um, Otherwise, I wouldn't know as much. Uh, Let's see. He's obviously very athletic, and it was amazing since he lost his uh, index finger and and thumb on his right hand because of an ad he was doing, and he was holding a a bomb that was supposed to be a fake bomb, and somehow it really went off. And so um, that really put him down for a while. So the fact – uh, when you're looking at his hand now, it's it's a prosthetic glove. Uh, so the fact that he can climb the building like that um, is just amazing. 
Uh, the, the commentators mentioned that Mildred Davis, who played the girl, uh, those two married each other right after this film. I think it was the last film she did with him, but she did three more somewhere else on her own after that. Uh, but they stayed married, as far as I know, to their deaths. Um, she was his second leading lady. Uh, I always liked the gag where they were in the uh, in the rooming house and the landlady was coming for her rent. So they jumped into uh, the long coats to hide. And I just recently saw, uh, I think it might have been his first full-length feature called Bumping into Broadway. And this was before he lost uh, his, his uh, part of his hand. And he did the same thing there. So he uses some of the gags more than once. Um, I didn't know that until I saw that. The roommate and friend was Bill Struther. He was a human fly in real life. He injured himself before the movie was shot, so he was in a lot of pain throughout this movie. And they weren't sure if they would have used him or not, but they figured, you know, he's the person for for the uh, job. Whenever they had uh, shots done from a distance, it was uh, Bill instead of uh, Harold. Um, and then they switched back. Uh, most of the comedians from the uh, from those days wore heavy clown white make, white makeup big mustache, and they were just gaudy in general. Had he, uh, Harold stood out for just being more natural and, and someone everyone can identify with in every man. Uh, the outdoor shots were the big things to watch in this uh, because you get to see Los Angeles as it was in the 20s. Um, I guess they did the climbing situation. I forgot how long it took. I don't know if they said two weeks or two months, but uh, however long it took, Everything you saw him do before that, they shot after that. So they got the action out of the way first. Uh, they tried to do as much as they could without title cards, which is what a lot of directors say, because they want to show you through action instead of bogging you down with words. Although some movies I've watched, uh, there's too much reading. Um, and I think that's about it for me. It was just highlights. Mm-hmm. Lily, did you did you did you catch well, up or did you? Yeah, I mean, I found I was just gonna basically do the synopsis of the film, but you kind of already did that. But you know, Lloyd is a country boy, sets out for his hometown from his hometown of Great Bend to make good in the big city, and you know, basically same thing. Mildred Davis, his real life wife, um, you know, she he promises to marry her once he's successful, but he keeps kind of finagling the truth saying, you know, he's uh, a GM of a department store when he's really just, you know, one of the sales clerks. And uh, eventually she does come to the city to see how everything's going on. And then hilarity ensues, of course. But uh, so he wants, (laughs) yeah, basically. (laughs) And the one way he, needs well he needs money because he's broke (laughs) so basically how he plans or plots to get the money is he overhears his real general manager talking about you know what's something that can what's this you know a great idea that'll help bring in people to their store and he thinks of his friend who is bill struther who in the film is his roommate as well who climbed up the side of a building to escape a cop so he's like oh i'll split the deal with you 50 50 if you can climb all the way up the building so it'll make good for the store and then he'll get a thousand dollars and then he can make his girlfriend proud except that he ends up quote unquote climbing up the building himself as in the film (laughs) yeah so i mean it's very good i mean i for having known how they did the gags i it's the way they cut and pasted the film itself together it still felt very real and i did have you know i was worried at certain parts if he might fall or what would happen because he gets attacked by pigeons at one time and you know when i was growing up like i remember hearing the pigeons coo outside my window so i'm already like (laughs) (laughs) so he's attacked by pigeons he's attacked by police officers he's attacked by a dog all while he's trying to climb up 14 stories or so on this building and the mouse. And the mouse. <laughs> and a block of wood. <laughs> I forgot that part. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mm. I remember. But what um, reading 
the bio in a sense from the San Francisco Silent Film Festival's webpage about Safety Last. Um, it was Harold Lloyd's fourth and most complex thrill comedy. And uh, he came upon the idea for the film after witnessing the human fly climb up the side of a tall building, which was Bill Struther. So naturally, he while he was watching him and freaking out down below, he's he uh, went to the top of the building where he met Bill. And he's like, you know, he gave him his address, told him to come out and visit Hal Roach and himself. And then he got listed to be a stuntman and work under Harold Lloyd. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. I think it's his most known one. Definitely. One of the most known. But it's it's a fun film as well because, you know, it. I liked the sneakiness and uh, kind of like him being a little shady with his girlfriend. I know it's not the best, but you never know when or if he might get caught, you know, especially seeing he's the general manager of the department store and bringing his girlfriend in there. And, you know, pushing buttons by mistake and then, you know, his coworkers come in and you don't know what's going to happen. If he's going to get caught then, he never does, which is surprising. <laughs> I think that was a real store that they shot in. Real department store. Oh, yeah. Yeah. they. I think they could only shoot at night. And sometimes you can see that when they end the camera where you can see the outside and it's night. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, it uh, seems a little drab for a department store, though. Well, it reminded me, of course, there's Joanne Fabrics now. He's working in the fabrics department. Yeah. So. Yeah. What about when he had everyone dive to the floor so this one woman could get what she wanted? Because she was yeah. stronger than everyone. Yeah, Dropping $50. Someone dropped $50, <laughs> and everyone's yeah. like, oh. Boom. <laughs> so here yeah, you go. Yeah, that was really good. A lot, a lot of good gags. Probably what one about of my the favorites. Beginning? Yeah. What about the beginning when he's uh, saying goodbye to everyone and it looks like he's in jail and there's a noose behind him? Mm, and then it ends up being a train station. I was like, okay, right. that's clever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that actually was, uh, I, you know, so, you know, a couple of de- decades ago when I was watching a lot of science, uh, silent films, I I don't think it was even available, the Harold Lloyd collection. So huh. uh, reading a little bit about this now, uh, it, it wouldn't have been available. He, uh, or the, uh, I don't even know who, who, whoever owns the rights to all of the, the filmographies, uh, basically they didn't negotiate anything until, what was it, 2005? Uh, onwards. It, it's actually from 2005 and beyond is when things started to loosen up and that you could have more access to watch his, uh, okay. filmography. Yeah, it said it didn't reach the public domain until last year in 2019. Well, this Although, particular movie, but like yeah. just his his uh, filmography in general, uh, most of which, and then Criterion then a few years later licensed stuff, and that's why they're now releasing yeah. things like Safety Last, which is now on Blu-ray. Well, the version I saw, it said 2005, so that, that matches up, and that's when right, the commentary because... was done. Yeah. Right, that's when they allowed people to start. So mine was earlier 2000, prior to that. So, wow. yeah, I, I, so thinking back, really, I don't think I've ever seen Harold Lloyd just because, you know, that's when I was most active and hadn't really done it since, you know, until I launched this podcast. So uh, it, this might be very much either the first or a handful. Maybe I watched his short. No, I don't remember. So this could be the first because for a long time, his work, has not been available, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, that explains so, why I got interested now instead of before. Yeah, really... well, it's really only now that things are uh, loosening yeah. up and being available. Um, it's a good time to, to, to have access. But I will say that um, uh, if you watch a lot of the silent film comedies, I, I, this is maybe just my own personal opinion, um, You'll often get a few gags in between um, because the gags from back then might have been funny if you were living in, you know, the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. And right. I think you will have understood what they were going for when you watch the gag. Mm-hmm. But I think now we're so far removed. We're close, you know, very much 100 plus years. And I think a lot of those context of 
what initially made them funny is very much lost. I think a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them. So to have those com comedy still work today as, as fresh as it was back then, uh, for most of the film, it's going to be near impossible. I think a big chunk of the film is still very much works. And so that's the feeling I have for the Chaplins and the Keatons and, uh, except for maybe like City Lights. I think Chaplin took so many, so long at making that movie that he perfected it. I think it did something yeah. or another. But, uh, with the exception of that one, I think, so having never seen Lloyd, I was very much astonished that I think he made like the perfect silent film comedy movie, like the perfect one. Right. Where you would go from one gag to the other that doesn't, in my opinion, rely on something that's, uh, Contemporary. Uh, of the, con the context of its time, but rather mm -hmm. that it's situational that will mm -hmm. last basically forever. And man, I was howling with laughter throughout the whole thing from start to finish. And I just didn't, I haven't really experienced that even we've, even though we've seen so many silent film comedies here, mm -hmm. but both on this podcast and my own, you know, viewings. And so I was, Pleasantly surprised, and I, I think all of those people that really champions, you know, that you've got fans who are in all these camps, right? Who are some people like the Jake Chaplin for the more sentimental, some people like the Keaton for the, the stunt and realism, and then, yeah. then you've got people in this camp, <laughs> the Lloyds. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't think you have to be in all of them. I think you can take all of them and appreciate all of them, which is probably more what I like, but. Having not really seen his stuff from start to finish, I was really my, like my jaws dropped to the floor. It's just an astonishing piece of work. Um, that it's something that you can just drop in the middle of even now in 2020 mm -hmm. and still get a lot of uh, out of it. It's still funny. It's still relevant. And like in, in, even in the beginning, you don't need any context to say that. Oh, okay. Well, he might be hanging and. All of a sudden, and you know, his dad was almost like the, the chaplain, right? Reading his last rites and, you know, his love, of course, but you know, with, with the mom and you just don't know what the contest and the conductor was like the guard, yeah. jail guard or something mm -hmm. trying to hurry him to this. <laughs> and of course you pull back, you know, the great Ben. And of course the great Ben has multiple meanings of life, right? Not just the town of. And so it's like the scenarios or the stories are, really rich uh and have multiple layers above and beyond just comedy right like some of the greatest comedians are also some of the most deadly serious too in terms of dramatics you know it, there's always needs to be some sort of uh maybe not always but there is commonly a uh a tie-in you know between something that's very dramatic and dark and the, the comedic you know mm -hmm. yeah so anyway as i i I really, really enjoyed this movie and it really, to me, feels like a perfect silent film comedy. Like from one gag to the other, there's just no letting up. Mm -hmm. Um, I showed this, uh, a few minutes, just the, uh, the train station sequence to my wife for a few minutes and she was like, wow, this is, she never really watch movies <laughs> in general. Actually, not just the modern movies, just movies in general. And right. she was like, this is pretty funny. And you, I never heard of her saying that. So it, I feel like it's something that you can take out of context, uh, out of any time and still work. It just works, you know, as mm -hmm. the film itself. Yeah. It mm -hmm. doesn't really, really need to rely on anything. Um, and Harold Lloyd himself plays this character to just perfection. Like the whole down and out character, the, you know, a little bit effeminate, a little bit like loser-like feeling that you get when you watch these type of you know down on their luck characters and it, it definitely very much an underdog right and you feel him when he's trying to say I'll, you know i'm gonna make something of myself before i send for you you know some respect mm -hmm. respectability <laughs> right, yeah. and of course you know you know the, the minute reality hits it's like he, they, he and his uh i guess is it billy the pal uh yeah, yeah. bill strother they were roommates, right? So the roommates, right. they, they can barely pay rent. And of course, the, the gag where the uh, landlord knocks on the door, they, they, when, when she tries to come in and check to see if they're home, they had to hide from her and they hid from her by, uh, 
climbing into their coats hung on on the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Almost like sacks of you know, you couldn't uh, say that, yeah. sacks of potatoes. <laughs> yeah, potatoes or you know, if you read into it a little bit more like they're regressing into babies, you know, being being uh stuffed back into the uterus. So, uh, I, I don't I really know. I just found <laughs> I, I just found that every bits and pieces of this is just incredibly funny of Yeah. The, the very skags, uh, the timing is incredible. Everything is, and you didn't need, again, to have some of those things. Like apartments still exist today. If you don't pay rent, you're still going to be out, down and out. And that's still relevant then and is, it is relevant today. There's nothing unique to that time, I, I think, um, in terms of the human experience, uh, that, that, uh, is different even now. And so. Yeah. The, um, there's, uh, I've mentioned before on Sundays on YouTube, they have, uh, Bill Modo, Modell. He does the right. silent comedies. And the thing I like about that is, uh, between him and Steve Masser, they talk about the comedy you were about to see and they explain the context. Like there was a cigar Indian outside the cigar right. store and he goes, well, you probably don't know, even know what that is. And he explains what the context is. So, uh, that's the right. fun thing about that show. Yeah, that's sidetrack. That's highly recommended if you guys ever have a chance. And what's great is so far they've left them on YouTube. So you can always go oh, back yeah. Yeah. to the old stuff. Mm-hmm. Just Google or go on YouTube and search for Ben Modell, M-O-D-E-L and look up his, um, silent comedies. Yeah. yeah he, exactly. he plays right live to the, um, you know, like on the, on the spur. Uh, he knows what the comedies are, but he, he hasn't written this ahead of time. He just plays and he knows how yeah, to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's as you would a companist. Uh, right, these, so it's, uh, earlier days. So I think it's just a really good show. Uh, yeah, something for, no, for the whole family. Yeah, for the whole family. But anyway, so going back to this uh, safety last, I just found all of that incredible. You know, from start to finish, uh, I I can't find, to me personally, any fault of it. Maybe you haven't seen it enough. Uh, afterwards, I think it started to play. Um, is it the freshman or no, Speedy or something? That was, that's the Keaton one. So the, the, uh, and I just like, I want so much of it and I stayed up a little bit to watch that, you know, even though I was watching it real late already, <laughs> but yeah. it was so good. I loved it, you know? And, um, so anyways, uh, Harold Lloyd, uh, I highly recommend it. Um, both this work or any of his works, I think. So yeah. To me, those comedies yeah. are the predecessor to the cartoons I grew up with, the Bugs Bunny and so forth. Right. It's almost the same thing. Yeah, which, you know, references a lot of this, especially the yeah. earlier ones. So. Oh, yeah. I was going to say probably one reason, too, that it's so enjoyable is it has a kind of naturalness to it. You know, nothing feels forced, especially in this um, film. I mean, the scenarios are a little wild at times, but I mean, hey, Black Friday is just as wild as it was in the store <laughs> <laughs> with all the women going after the fabric. So yeah, hey, it was a fifty on the floor. That would still work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that was. Oh, that reminds me of that yeah. scene where the lady only wanted a sample. He he. So it was like one o'clock, and he's about to leave for work. Yeah. He's probably yeah. was waiting for him. I was outside. so mad at her. <laughs> I know, and she came in and just. You know, she's that retail store person, the last person. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, right before it closes, right? And, you know, I've worked retail a long time ago in the past. And I know, I remember this, you know, it's like. That still happens. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's closing time, you know, and this person walks in. It's like, oh, uh, make some. And they want everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they ruffle through everything. And all of a sudden, she just wanted a sample. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. she walks away and she's about to turn back. He just like climbs out of there. She hides. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah, see, natural. Cause it's like, it's still like that a hundred years later. It's yeah. the same exact thing at like my job for the donut shop. You know, people are like, Oh, what do you recommend? So we tell them this, oh, yeah. that, the other red, yellow, green, blue. Yeah. And then they're just like, you know what? I'm going to take a small salad. And they're just like, okay, we don't sell that, but whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're just like, Oh, <laughs> forget your opinion. Yeah. yeah. They like to do a lot of bald and toupee jokes in the, those comedies too. Yeah. Uh, they did both in that movie. He was combing his hair on the reflection of the bald guy's head. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. It's good visual toupee. effects too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I also think like <laughs> um the uh you know, there are a lot of focus of course on the the uh the sort of the last scene, the climbing and stuff. Um which you know I I heard upon how it's influential even on stuff like Back to the Future when Doc is hanging off the clock, right? So oh, obvious okay. homage. Oh, okay. So um, yeah. it's you know throughout many many movies there's a lot of references like that. Um and um anyway so what was I trying to say was like just just that last scene um. I think it it is good, but I also feel like of, of all the comedies I've seen, um, there's a tendency. I'm not saying all of them are like that, um, but there's a tendency for silent film comedies to have a uh, series of gags that connect to each other, which all all of which harkens back to their silent short days, right? Uh-huh. I think um, Adam, you made this point about the Battle of the Century. Even the Laura Hardy one was like, it was like three separate movies basically, right? Just stitched together, you know? Yeah. Uh, because there really is no through line, right? From, no, from well, the start. Not that I saw. Yeah. Right, exactly. So, but what's different about this film is that there is a through line that even though that there are different gags throughout the entire movie itself, it's still about this idea that, um, Harold Lloyd's playing this character that really wants to provide for his future family and make right, you know, both for himself, for the parents, for his future life, right? I mean, he he forgoes, even there's a scene in there, he forgoes a meal. Love that scene yes. where he's like, he he goes in to look for like a necklace or something that costs yeah. for the 16 bucks or, <laughs> or whatever it is. 15, and yeah. as his, the last few coins that he has to give away, he gives like, you know, a certain amount of coins away. It means... One less sandwich, you know. Uh, there's a visual representation of the meal that he was about to eat. And it was like, uh, you know, one less, you know, uh, egg, one less potato, whatever it was. You know, I don't remember the detail. But, like, it was just like that. Right, right. Each plate disappearing. And finally, the la- with the last coin, it was completely gone. And even though he has this thing, this necklace for his fiance slash future wife, he literally tightened up his buckle <laughs> Yeah. And say his belt rather and say, Yep, oh, chin up, guy, let's let's keep going, you know, and this uh I think that story, that through line is I think what makes it um uh, for me on the Lloyd films is that at least for this one, that there's a through line, it's so strong, right? Every single piece and element of this feature is contributing towards that primary narrative. So it's not just going from one gag to the other to the other, right? You know what I mean? Probably Chaplin probably has the closer, I think, would be of the of the two. And I think a lot of the Keaton works is, is just from one gag to the other to the other, you know. Yeah. So that's why I really enjoy it. Yeah. Very good film. Mm-hmm. Any other parting thoughts from y'all? Uh, I think that's it for me. I did um, found it interesting that they had a shot at the speaking of the final final shot of the building where he's climbing the building. There's a shot of it looking down, like the shots of uh, Harold Light climbing the building. We know how the effects are achieved. Do you want to take a stab at explaining it, either of you, of how it works? Well, the yeah. bottom half of oh. Go ahead, Lily. Well, you talk about the bottom half. I'll talk about the uh, sure. actual uh, the, top half. <laughs> the bottom half was the facade. I think it might have been – I'm not sure if – it had to. maybe it was in the studio. I didn't really understand that. But it wasn't a real building because it was made specifically for him to grab on. Um, you know, if you put your hand in the crevice, there was a loop underneath so it could easily climb up. Uh, mm-hmm. But from then after that, it was, it was a building. Go ahead. Okay. Very interesting because uh, – the part that I remember watching in the the old silent film stars talking about the films, um, so how they achieved the height was he was actually on it like the roof of a building with the team, and then they had a giant platform 
to give more height and depth to make it seem as if he was climbing extremely high where really he was only like 15 feet above the roof and he, but you know he's still in safe distance of falling in case he did fall he's not going to fall to the ground you know 10 stories he's only going to fall 10 feet yeah it's amazing insurance covered that yeah because they said Cause they, even 15 feet is still you can hurt yourself yeah because they didn't even want him to do half the stunts because right. because of the insurance you know you lose your star forget it <laughs> that's it yeah yeah and considering you, you only uh, had one hand <laughs> if you look at your uh message platform i just sent you a link and if you open it it directs you to a um article talking about that with screenshots but then there's a video embedded in there i think it's from criterion actually criterion collection is one of the behind the scenes clips oh. which has a cg oh, cool. model of how he did the effects which is like oh, I basically basically they selected a building uh uh another high-rise building they're just on the rooftops and on top of the rooftop they build a scaffold mm -hmm. and the scaffold will be a false wall and so what lloyd's climbing is a false wall on top of the scaffold on top of a roof of a high-rise and that high-rise of course the backdrop of the high-rise is the cityscape and so visually the camera is placed on a platform filming lloyd climbing this fake false wall um on a scaffold with the cityscape in the background of course the camera itself is pretty so high up that you don't see the fact that you're on a roof of already a high-rise yourself right that's the visual effect mm -hmm. does that make sense yeah mm -hmm. what i'm saying or verbally trying to communicate it <laughs> it's always tough to verbally communicate the effect sounds but um anyway I I, things best with sock puppets yeah so all three of us knowing that effect and how it was done uh, still found it like riveting. I think part of the riveting part for me was that they had a uh, shot looking downward from the roof. And I think of Billy, the limp guy, climbing the actual real building. So to me, I think that sells it. I think the false wall thing is because we already know how, how that works. Right. I think you can kind of, okay, I know how it works. But it's still like visually the way they shot it. I think it's those shots that looks down mm -hmm. uh, on the actual height of the building where you see the actual crowd at the bottom and Billy climbing an actual wall without any ropes. Right. I think that to me sells it because it's when you intercut that with Lloyd on the, um, on the false wall that, that to me, like if you didn't know any of this background, like we do. Yeah. You're going to be like, holy cow, he's oh, actually yeah. on the wall. You well, know? The, the commentary said that uh, yeah. Bill was uh, held with uh, piano wire just as an uh, added oh, measure. Yeah, and he yeah, didn't yeah. like that at all because he wanted to do it for real, but they said no. So, yeah. <laughs> because that's how he did it, though. He did it for real, right. and that's how Lloyd saw him. So. But they put piano wire on him. According to the commentary, uh, I can only yeah. go by that. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Any other parting thoughts? I'm good. No, I was just reading about his safety last with the stunts, so. Uh, no, I don't have any more to add to this movie. Yeah, we'll put that in the show notes, that link in there. But um, it really is timeless, this one. This one is not tied to any specific time. It's just, um, you know, it's comedy gold uh, wrapped in in uh, a very, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward plot. It's not like, you know, unique or new or anything like that, but it's what he does with it, you know, and that's the best movies is the plot's going to be there. It's not going to be anything different or weird or anything like that, but it's some, very much how he makes the plot his own and how he actually goes about doing these things that uh makes makes the movie right yeah mm. and i think uh, you know if we had all the time in the world we'd keep talking about it but um we'll just wrap it up with that last thought so 
Thank you very much, um, Lily. Thanks uh, very much, Adam, and our listeners as well. And uh, you can find more of our stuff at watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. Again, that's watchingsilentfilmsplural.wordpress.com. And you can uh, send us an email if you have questions, thoughts, comments at watchingsilentfilms at gmail.com. If you wouldn't mind still leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts or any podcast platform you are uh, reaching us by. And that's pretty much what we have. So thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Ciao. Bye.